Well, I want to give a good hearty amen to that, to watching you all interact here together. Our scripture this morning, as Talasha said, comes from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. And as we have heard, uh, we, we call this the Lord's Prayer. So, I invite you to listen. He, Jesus, was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. The word of the Lord. Now if you're thinking, where's the rest of it? This is not what we have memorized, what we sing, what we say when we say the Lord's Prayer. Well, that is a great question, and I'm not going to answer that here. I invite you to come join the youth during Sunday school in the basement, and that's going to be our topic of conversation there for that sermon discussion. But for now, what I want us to to look at, what I'm curious about, is the placement of this prayer within the story that Luke is telling of Jesus' life and ministry and teaching. Luke has 24 chapters, and all those chapters came in later, but here we are in chapter 11, so it kind of mathematically clues us in to we're kind of about halfway through Jesus' ministry. And by this time, the disciples have learned a lot about following Jesus, and they themselves have done some really amazing things. In chapter 9, Jesus sends out the 12 disciples, and when they go, they can't take anything with them. And their instructions from Jesus are to tell everyone about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And that is what they did as they went about the area. Then, a little later in chapter 9, there are other familiar stories to us, including the story of the feeding of the 5,000. In chapter 10, Jesus sends out 72 disciples again. And they go with nothing to not take any bag, any extra clothes, not even a walking stick. And as they go, they are told to heal the sick and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another story in chapter 10. Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? Love, your neighbor as, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And then that probing question, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus replies with a story, one that we call the Good Samaritan story. So the disciples have experienced the power of God at work in them and through them by this point. They have heard and watched Jesus teach and perform miracles. They are deep into the way of following Jesus by this point. And if anyone knows how to follow Jesus, it should be these these people. And then one of them asks the question, how do we pray? Uh, Yeah, I, I don't quite get why this question is asked. This is like being in algebra and asking, what's two plus two? The disciples, it seems, have kind of Missed the basics. They've done some of the advanced work already, but they're missing a basic thing. The follow-up comment, or the, the question here, how do we pray? John taught his disciples, so Jesus, what's our special prayer? I think this is going a little deeper to an identity question for the disciples. John, they've kind of got this way of praying, this secret handshake, so to speak. So Jesus, what's ours? What is the thing that makes us unique as your followers, as your disciples? But I also wonder if the disciples are sensing something bigger going on here, sensing a change that is coming, sensing that maybe the way that humans relate to God is shifting. 
They know that things have changed in the past, and so could it be, as they are following Jesus, that something big is going on here and they are part of it? That people may look back on them and go, wow, these guys got to hang out with Jesus. Historically, these disciples know that as they look back on Scripture, God gave their ancestors a way to worship and pray in the temple. And then, during a time of exile and tragedy, the temple was destroyed. They were taken away, and, and how they related to God had to change. In that time of exile, they learned new ways of worshiping God, new ways of passing on the faith, and these synagogues were created, these local gathering places where they could debate the scriptures and, and wrestle with the scriptures and what they mean in their local context. When they couldn't go to the temple, they had the synagogue. And the longer these disciples followed Jesus, I wonder if they sensed something, a, a growing change may be coming again in their time and in their place. That the way, the methods and the modes of connecting with God and following God and understanding how God is at work, maybe those things were changing. So this, this question that I think is a little humorous at first, how do we pray, is, is I think pointing to something a little deeper. For us, in our time, we, I think we kind of understand this disorientation that maybe the disciples were feeling. We have been through disorienting times over the last several years. Don't need to elaborate on that very much at all. So in those times, we look to identities for ourselves, ways to help us cope with the changes that are happening. And we've seen it. We, we all choose sides on many things, in politics, theology, masks, music, food, I like college basketball, so I'm choosing sides this month, especially with some certain teams, Rock Chalk Jayhawk. <laughs> so, but who do you identify with? What is the sign, the symbol of who you are a part of? We also have disorientation in our families at times, too, and in our homes. A child wakes up sick in the morning, and you know that the whole day is going to look a little different than what you had planned. There's a nagging pain, and you go to the doctor and you realize this is something more than just a nagging pain. Mental health issues can play havoc on the people that we love. Legal issues can just hang over us and weigh on us. Children grow up and they leave home. Children grow up, leave home, and come back. Disorientation. Relationships between spouses become, can become strained at times, or spouses die. We have disorienting things that happen all the time, and we can't hide from them. We also have disorientation happening here at church, and I think I, I would describe this disorientation this way for us as college Mennonites. As a church, I think we are just stumbling into a new way of following the Holy Spirit. We have always excelled at doing good discerning work together, whether that's around tables in the fellowship hall or in room 100 at meetings and times together. And then from that discernment, we know how to put that plan down on paper and write out how we are going to follow the Holy Spirit. And when it's on paper, we can distribute it and the plan and the process to, so that everyone knows what the secret handshake of CMC is. Now, if you're like me, good process is, is orient, orienting. It is comforting. And I don't want to belittle that approach of following the Holy Spirit. But I also take the theological stance that the Holy Spirit is and does work in those times of making a plan and a process and discernment, but also that the Spirit can work quickly when needs arise and 
a bunch of people with resources to share are ready to offer. We, I think, feel a little bit disoriented because God's Spirit has been at work in us and through us in a different way lately as a congregation. And sometimes it feels like we don't know what the secret CMC handshake is anymore. Is it a handshake? Is it a fist bump? Is it an elbow? Is it a bow? What is it? Pretty sure it's probably not a holy kiss with a pandemic going on, but we wonder, what is it that makes us unique? So we're having the same question that the disciples had. How do we pray? How do we talk to God? And Jesus does something out of character, it seems, for Jesus. When he's asked this question, he doesn't respond with another question. He doesn't respond with a story. Jesus simply answers the question. This is how you pray. In this season of Lent, we are talking about bread and food. And so that's the phrase of the prayer that Jesus gives that I want to focus in on here for a little bit. When Jesus gives the words, give us this day our daily bread, there is a, there's a lot of built-in layers to that phrase, some of them that we've already sung about this morning. I think the disciples immediately thought back to the time, the stories that they heard of the Exodus, of God's people being drawn out of a time of slavery, but then also into a wilderness time where they had to depend on God for everything. A time of daily trust that God would provide food, provide some kind of manna bread thing that we still can't figure out what the recipe is. But it was daily food from God for the good of the people. Teaching them that they didn't have to trust in Pharaoh or in anyone else, but only trust in God. And then if we look back here in the story of Luke at the disciples' recent past, at the things that they had done and seen, when Jesus sent out the 12 and sent out the 72, they also were put into a time of deep trust in God. No extra clothes, no extra bag, trusting God to provide for them. Trusting God to meet their needs as they themselves were looking for what other people's needs were and finding ways to meet those needs through the power of God. And when we look just to the story immediately before this one, at the very end of chapter 10, it's another story about food. The story of Jesus visiting Mary and Martha. This was a story that we talked about in worship in mid-February, so it should be still kind of familiar to some of us, where Mary sits at Jesus' feet and soaks in every word that Jesus has to say, while Martha is busy in the kitchen. And Martha asks Jesus, hey, Jesus, come on, help my sister be a better hostess here. And Jesus' reply is that, no, Martha, Mary has chosen the one good thing, and that will not be taken away from her being at the feet of Jesus, the one good thing. So in this prayer, in the Lord's Prayer, as we call it, the prayer starts out first with recognizing God's holiness. God in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, aligning then our hopes and our desires for what God wants in this world. And then, our first request from ourselves, give us this day our daily bread. I don't think that is just a request for ourselves. As we look back at the Exodus story, at the recent time of the disciples, if we look at the request for daily bread through the lenses of those stories, I think it adds more meaning to what our request for daily bread is. In the Exodus story, we have to acknowledge that a request for daily bread is a request for daily trust 
in God, a God who we have seen over and over again pro- provides abundantly more than we can imagine. Through the experience of the disciples going out to tell about Jesus, we see that when we trust God, we become part of God's process of miracles, of daily justice for the oppressed, and salvation for those in need. We see the ways that God's work flows through us, not in a hierarchical way of those with a lot passing on to those with not quite as much. That's not, what, that's not how the disciples experienced it. They were also in need. And they entered into this kind of reciprocal sharing of blessings as they went out to proclaim God's kingdom. And I think when we are in those times, we have sensed that too. Times of sharing with others where we don't know And it's hard to tell who the giver and who the receiver is because of this kind of reciprocal flow of God's love and God's blessings. And through the story of Mary and Martha, we see that as we trust God to provide, sometimes we're doing more sitting at Jesus' feet and less bustling around in the kitchen like Martha. And so when we pray this prayer for daily bread and are reminded of the story of the Exodus, we have to let go of the recipe for what this bread will look like. And I think, too, as a congregation, we kind of know this feeling. When we pray the prayer for daily bread, some of us have the picture in our head of a nice whole wheat loaf made from a recipe from the More With Less cookbook. And in reality, God is giving us Conchas and baleadas, breads that we're not quite sure what to do with. For some of us who are new to this community and to this church, some of our lives have been turned upside down, and all we long for are the familiar ingredients of home. And instead, it seems like God is giving us American pizza. Now, I don't want to put a value judgment on any of those foods. That's not what I'm trying to do. When we pray, when we pray for daily bread, we must pray the prayer and let God provide. We must trust God to provide. And we have to let go of the sequences of events sometimes, some of the processes and steps that seem basic and comforting to us. Sometimes God may provide us with a nearly completed project before we've had any time to do research or set a goal or create a strategy. When we pray for daily bread and trust God to provide, we have to let go of the complexity and enjoy Sabbath and resting in the presence of Jesus. When we pray for daily bread and trust God to provide, it can be very miraculous and humbling because the God who we honor and glorify above everything else is also taking a very personal interest in us. It's taking a personal interest in what we put on our plates and what we put in our bodies so that we can be part of God's work of love in this world. The divine is caring about us and paying attention to our most basic needs. Our identity as followers of Jesus, our secret handshake, so to speak, is to trust God, is to trust that our daily needs will be met, and to trust that God will meet those daily needs in ways that sometimes aren't normal, they're not sequential, sometimes they might seem too easy, but always in ways that multiply the love of God in those around us. As I was 
preparing for this sermon, there was a song from my childhood that kept popping into my head the whole time. Uh, a, A scripture song from Proverbs 3. Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn from evil. And this will bring healing to your body and rest to your bones. Amen.